advice. You never know if it could change your life. Take a chance, you need a wrong or right. You never know if you're wrong and dice. You better roll them. Uh, hello, Matt. Hi, Rob. Uh, good morning. How are you? How 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 is everything? Uh, we're doing well over here. Everything's fine here. A uh, small reactor leak. It's locked down. Everything's normal now. How are you? <laughs> Great. Matt, do you know how wide the U.S. standard railroad gauge is? Uh, oh, shit. Uh, uh, Robert Fogel's going to be really mad at me uh, for not remembering <laughs> uh, his paper. No, I, I, I don't. That's okay. It's, it's I, very I remember specific. it got standardized after the Civil War, though. The, the, there's, a, there's no reason why you would need to, to know this it, precisely, but it's, it's four feet and 8.5 inches. Mm. Now, Matt, God's number. God's, God's number. number. A very, very precise number. Um, it's actually uh, a Masonic number. No, uh, actually, uh, the reason, Matt, yeah. why the, the railroad gauge is four feet, 8.5 inches, is because... That's, that's your height, Rob, right? <laughs> Listen, we do stand short kings on this podcast, yeah. but I am taller than that. Um, <laughs> is because that's how wide they are in England. And Matt, oh. do you know why they're that wide in England? I'm going to say uh, because there were uh, wagons that wide. I, I You're close. Wagons. Very close. Okay. That's right. It's because that is the width of the Imperial Roman War Chariot, uh, the, ah. the, 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 the length between the wheels, and thus the roads in yeah, England. If I remember correctly, the Romans built a lot of railroads. They did. So, yeah. They did. They yeah. built a they lot of roads railroads. from whence the, Ra- the railroads. railroads Railroads. were developed, right? Yeah, so so right. that is why the U.S. data railroad gauge is the exact same width as the Imperial Roman chariot. And in much the same way, Matt, yeah. because Gary Gygax forced his players into <laughs> a dungeon with only one path, we too must uh, railroad our players and uh, disallow oh, them. Oh, I see where you're going. Oh. Disallow oh. them any sort of agency and or action. Hello, everyone. This is Dungeon Master of None. I'm Dungeon Master Matt. <laughs> and I'm Dungeon Master Rob. It's the great railroading debate. <laughs> the great railroading debate, yes. Uh, by popular demand, Matt and I are going to be talking about railroading. Uh, and boy, is there a lot to say about that. Also, the thing about the Roman War Chariot may or may not be true, but it's a funny story. Uh, there's probably yeah. a more, the, re, frankly, that's just like a good width for things. It's probably more likely that that's just, you know, trains and carts and cars and things just sort of need to be that wide. Uh, It's maybe not exactly partially true. Anyway, the point is railroading. Railroading. Yeah, I'm imagining a wagon that's like eight feet wide. (laughs) Sounds fun. A nice wide boy. Listen, let's go back in time and tell the Romans to make their wagons wider. And then we can have bigger, cooler trains. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Mega trains. Super um, trains. We love trains. And here. railroading. And railroads. Um, Not railroading. Diesel trains, electric trains, Amtrak trains. Uh, we also like streetcars. We also like other types of trains. One of the Buses most disappointing are things I learned is that there used to be a streetcar running outside the, the, the window I am looking at right now oh man it's gone the, i now. i learned the same thing when i moved here that the the streetcar in portland used to come literally right to the right to this street right in front of my home um no yeah. longer we're so horny for streetcars we we want them back folks bring bring back streetcars everybody I was in new orleans and they got streetcars they're they got, really they're, slow they're, yes <laughs> they might be better replaced with buses but what, whatever <laughs> they're they're cool they're cool Fucking cool they're, they're very cool they're very heavy. They're very slow. And uh, so, okay. So railroading is one of those words that if you have looked up anything about how to game master or dungeon master, you've probably encountered before. Yeah, this is one of those. This is, this is. Oh, I don't know if this is the most, but maybe the most discussed sort of DM issue online. There's a lot of railroading discourse, and it's something yeah. that a lot of people are, are familiar with. A lot of people have weighed in on. And there's been an awful lot of talk about it recently. There's a lot of bad advice, but at the heart of the issue is, like, some good advice, which is why we're going to talk about it. It's also, like, one of those things that, like, if your players are unhappy with you, they can accuse you of being a railroader. It's it's sort (laughs) of the, like... Are you now or have you ever been a railroading dungeon master? And if you don't give up some names, yeah, uh, 
Yes. I'm going to kick you out. Uh, anytime your players feel dissatisfied or things don't go your their way, uh, you may find yourself in front of the House Un-American Railroading Commission uh, and having to defend yourself. So okay, let's let's define. Yeah. So some our first terms task here, here, yeah, uh, is is a definition section of terms. one. <laughs> definition of terms. Uh, Webster's defines railroading as uh, actually Webster's doesn't have a definition for railroading because they it's might. A, it's an old word. Um, as a r- using railroading as a like uh, verb has been around for at least a hundred years. <laughs> By the way, because sorry, this people is a- love talking about railroads because they used to be the only cool thing around. I don't know if you knew this. This isn't really about railroading, but the the phrase "run out of town on a rail." They used to like actually do that to people. They would like put people like politicians or whoever that they didn't like. They would. Uh, you, you, this happened in uh, Oh Brother Where Art Thou? Yeah, but literally like it's great scene. S- string them up to a rail and like run them out of town. Anyway, that's what your players will do to you if you railroad them. No, uh, the dictionary defines railroading as to press someone into doing something by rushing or coercing them. I guess that's true. I guess that's so. But when people talk about this in the context of game mastering or dungeon mastering, it gets pretty fuzzy. So, Matt, do... We're going to talk about some other definitions of railroading because this is sort of what sparked this conversation is that Matt came across a some some discourse where mm, th- things were being brought up that were that were you know this is railroading but it, it may or may maybe, not have been and maybe not and so what what do we think railroading is matt right okay yeah let's start with a good definition so so you'll have that in the back of your, your mind as you listen to this i think railroading a good definition is right it kind of related to the old uh school uh, Webster's dictionary definition. It's it's taking away player choice. Right, right. Or either taking away player choice or having a single uh, predetermined outcome for your adventures, right? If you're doing either of those things, you know, that might be considered railroading. So you're forcing something on I read people. a bunch on this, and I think, I think it has to... So the critical part is that it has to negate player choice right it's okay for you to have a pre-determined or preconceived outcome as a dm as long as you don't force your players to get there by negating their choices the two kind of work together though you to, to to be railroading you really need to be deliberately and aggressively pushing your players towards one set of outcomes or one outcome and deliberately either removing or narrowing their agency. That's the key part. Well, I mean, I would say I would stand by my initial definition that if you have a single predetermined outcome and that's going to happen no matter what, um, you know, in in most cases to me, that is that is a, a form of railroading. And I think we then have to ask, why is this bad? Because I, I've seen a lot of people um, other dungeon masters be like, well, you know, there's good railroading and bad railroading or something like that. Um, do you, well, do, I, do you I, agree I'm, that there could be good ba- railroading and bad railroading? Like, isn't it good to negate player choice sometime? I, I think we got to pin this down some more. I think, I think I'm going to have to, to okay. push you on something, right? So sure. most published adventures, most written adventures, and most homebrew adventures have some core predetermined outcomes, right? In Rise of Tiamat, Tiamat is the bad guy, right? Tiamat is the the ultimate villain, right? The the opponent for whom all things drive. Is it railroading to have, you know, a god dragon with a bajillion heads be the final boss? Five. Five. No, not at all. Not at all, right? And but that's I think a pre- what you're- but that's a predetermined outcome, Matt. That's... I think what you're describing, right, is a story path that you and your players have decided to play, right? The players are going to confront Tiamat or her cults or something uh, in some way, right? Railroading would be saying that no matter what happens, right, Tiamat will appear in this location in this way and the players must defeat her using X, Y, and Z, and the players will defeat her, and then everything will return to the status quo, right? Right. 
if it's railroading, that has to happen, right? If it's not railroading, well, what if the players join the cult of Tiamat and infiltrate it from the inside and then bring it down by corrupting their summoning ritual or ally with Tiamat or, you know, kill Tiamat before the appointed time, preventing whatever cool apocalypse scene that the dungeon master had planned. If those are all possibilities that could happen, then it's not railroading, right? You've just established a story, a, a plot, a world, and that's okay. So we agree on this. I, I just okay. want to make sure all that right. we're being being precise about our terms because this is what I'm talking about. When having a preconceived idea of how the story will progress or an outcome isn't inherently railroading. It's when the players have to... Uh, it's not it's not railroading if the players will always encounter an ogre. It's railroading if they have to fight the ogre, right? right. Like the, the, this is the other sort of thing that comes up when people talk about railroading is the the idea of the quantum ogre, right? The mm -hmm. there's a there's a path in the woods and there's two forks and no matter which way the players go, right? There's an ogre, right? They they can't do anything to avoid the ogre. This is often brought up as an, an example of railroading. But a, yeah, it's like a invisible railroading that the players can't see, right? Exactly. But it's also like a false choice. Like, do the players have any information about what might be down the two paths? If there's no meaningful choice, right, then you might as well be on a railroad, right? It all right. brings us back to this idea of player choice. Are your players right. able to affect the world, which is like the whole point of these types of games in the first place? Right. And this is where it gets difficult because... What makes it railroading is when you remove player agency. Right. Now, there taking are, away player choice, taking away player agency. There are lots of ways to get your players to vaguely follow the path you have laid out for them. There are lots of things that can happen logically within the world where the players will not achieve their desired result, but that's not necessarily railroading. It becomes difficult when, or it becomes railroading when the DM or the GM forcefully or sort of like tries to keep them within the boundaries or in uses sort of uh, either deliberate mechanical forces or just straight up tells them they can't do something. Right. The, the act of railroading can happen. I think it's, um, you know, railroading is like it can be both a noun and a verb. And I think it's best to think about it as a verb. Like it's mm -hmm. an action that, you know, the dungeon master does at the table. And it can happen in small ways, like players like, well, I, I attempt to use my uh, longbow plus three of, of sniping to shoot the magic jewel out of the villain's hands when they're not looking so they can't complete the ritual. And, you know, they roll a 19 and then the dungeon master says, well, you fail, right? Um, because, uh, you know, they... They, they've negated a player's choice and actions by saying either you can't succeed or you can't fail at a particular action. So you could think about it as like a small scale verb. Right. I think there's also like a, a large scale verb, right? What you're describing with uh, the ogre or a plot, right? Is that no matter what the players choose on the macro level of the adventure, all roads lead to the Lich, right? All roads lead to confronting uh, Tiamat in this particular location and way. Right. Even more granularly, once they get there, there's no conversation, there's no opportunity for any sort of approach except you must fight the bad guy in this exact location under the terms laid out. You know, there's no, no opportunity for any sort of uh, player choice. There's no, uh, not even a, a hint of being able to, to do something uh, distinct or unique, you have to just sort of play the scenario out as it's laid out. So maybe we should talk about some specifics because this is part of why railroading is so difficult to pin down right. and why there's so much argument about it is because people aren't always talking about the same thing. And so let's talk about some actual railroading scenarios and okay. try to determine or potential railroading scenarios and say, is this railroading? Is it not? Is it good? Is it bad? And then hopefully we can kind of reach a hmm. satisfying conclusion on this. A consensus between the two of us. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I like that. The post that sparked this conversation for us, which then kind of got rolled into a bunch of other, as as this was coming up, 
uh, was about having intelligent NPCs and using basic logic. Now, there are several examples. This is a Reddit post. Several examples here, and you can we can agree or disagree on whether or not this is intelligence or basic logic, but we should talk about whether or not it is railroading. And then we can talk about some examples of obvious examples of railroading. So the person in question for this post uh, writes, railroading the party is one of the cardinal sins of being a DM and something that almost every party dislikes. However, there's also plenty of cases where the DM does something fully reasonable and players try to complain about being railroaded, often to try and pressure the DM into letting them do what they want. Let's go through the examples of what isn't railroading. All right. Okay. So, well, first I want to stop stop there, right? And I okay. think this is a, a good mindset to get into your mind. And it's definitely like a, a, a dungeon mastering style choice, but it's mm. one I would encourage most dungeon masters to embrace, which is, you know, the, the, the basic like improv, like default to yes, and or yes but like okay if the players are going to try something right default to yeah let's try that right um notice that you know there's not just one remember we had keith baker on and there's like you know i've run this particular scenario a thousand times mm -hmm. and every 20 or 30 times players come up with a completely logical course of action that makes sense right um to them and uh, it makes sense given everything they know about the world. So I'm going to go with that, right? I'm going to say yes to my players. Otherwise, they'll feel really frustrated. And this is a good example. I think we can get into this at the end, but I think the a, a key takeaway here is that railroading is a rookie DM mistake. It is something that is employed by DMs that lack experience and confidence. And Keith Baker is obviously an incredibly talented and experienced DM. And so, and also he's run that encounter or that um, adventure, like he said, dozens, if not hundreds of times. So he has complete knowledge and mastery of it. And it is not a challenge for him to adjust on the fly if the players do something uh, bonkers. But this is, this is challenging. And this is sometimes, I think, what happens when we get into this conversation about railroading. But that's a good example, right? Yeah. Um, so here's from this post some examples of what what is, according to this person, not railroading. In quotes, what? We attack the Lord of Death and die right away? Yes, he's a lich and the big bad evil guy of the entire campaign. You're level two. Matt, is this railroading? Um, I'm actually going to say for this, like, OK, so you have a low level party confronting a very powerful lich uh and uh i if if the players choose to attack them they're immediately killed and the campaign ends um i'm guessing the other solution the the only other solution is the players i guess do whatever the lich wants them to do right uh, it's not no 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 other example is given so yeah. uh, you know this is yeah to to me that that feels pretty uh railroady right in that uh okay well the only solution is the players are confronted with a challenge that they cannot overcome right well, uh, and this is so there's no a, real choice for the players right this is a great point because there's a lot of missing information here sure where are they encountering the lord of death is he just wandering through town did they somehow break into his secret lair 20 levels too early uh you know, do they see him from afar and try to cast magic missile on him? What you know, if they're placed in a room with the Lord of Death uh, and he wants to monologue at them, the player choice is either do nothing mm. or attack and die. That isn't tech. Well, that's technically railroading, actually. I would say. Yeah. Be so so you know, in some scenarios, in some circumstances, this is not. But it it's not. I think egregious if the players are put in a situation where they're in a room with a very powerful person or enemy and if they attack they'll die i think that's that's reasonable however you know usually it's 
usually there's like a reason for it. Usually there's somehow it fits within the story. You know, there, there are going to be plenty of circumstances in which your players are unable to solve a problem through combat. Right. But forcing them to either sit and obey or listen to anybody is kind of railroady. Yeah. I think, it might be useful here to take a step back and think about why is railroading bad? <laughs> right. Right? Why is it that players dislike this so much? And I think from a player's perspective, right, railroading always feels like the cutscene in a video game. Right. Does anyone like cutscenes? No. No one likes cutscenes. Especially and and video games have going for them uh, thousands and thousands of person hours and artists and voice actors, you know, to make something look pretty. Mm -hmm. The cutscene of your railroading where this has to happen and players can do nothing to affect the outcome, it's just you, the dungeon master, talking, which is super boring. Right. So, of course, your players get antsy. And they're like, ah, I hate this. Exactly. Well, and this is, yeah, if you put your players in a room and you make them listen to your villain monologue, they're going to hate that. <laughs> they're going to hate that, and they're either going to try to cut it short by starting a fight or leaving, and if they can't do either, that's going to make them feel like they lack agency, and they do. And that's an issue, you know? We, right. We've talked if about this you... a lot. You know, you should never be... You should never be talking yourself for very long, and you should never be talking to yourself, and... You know, th this is, I again, we're making some assumptions about the scenario in question here, but if you're encountering your big bad evil guy and you know it's the big bad evil guy, what, it, what, what is the, what is the scene in question trying to accomplish? If your setup is that, you know, oh, the players have to go retrieve the sixth part of the rod of seven parts and you're like, well, I could, uh, you know, cast a geas on them or I could put them in front of a lich that's going to threaten to murder them if they don't, you know, those outcomes are fairly similar. Uh, but I think one of the consequences of making players like watch a cut scene like this, right, where there's a villain they can't interact with in a meaningful way, where none of their choices matter um, in the short run, right, in that scene, players feel bored and frustrated. But I think there's also some long-term consequences, right? Players become, you know, a little, uh, you know, they feel, <laughs> they feel like this isn't about them, right? Mm -hmm. They feel a little uh, taken advantage of, right? Mm -hmm. They begin to check out of the adventure, right? As it drags on, as they're subjected to these, these uh, negation of their choices week after week after week, right? You're, you're, you're destroying your, your, your role-playing community, like, bit by bit. Um. The Alexandrian talks about this a lot and has a whole series on railroading. And he calls what Matt just described abused gamer syndrome. Oh, yeah. And sure. you'll, you will encounter players that are always looking for the railroad because they're so used to being on it. And they will sometimes even get frustrated and lash out. Uh, because they're trying to find right. it and tell us what you want us to yeah, do. Tell us what you want us to do. What, you know, we're, we're doing what you want us to do. And you tell them, no, you can do whatever you want. And they get, they get frustrated, you know, because they've only ever, you know, been on rails and they've been punished, right. For trying to deviate from that. And so they expect to be punished if they do anything, but what, uh, you know, the DM intends them to do. And this is, you know, this is a relatively common problem. Um, you know, a lot of players still think like this. Uh, here's another scenario, Rob. Uh, thanks for bringing up that first one about the lich that I ran into reading things about railroading on the internet. And it was a, a player described uh, that uh, their dungeon master had, uh, you know, was very much against railroading, but had a plot of a evil sorcerer that was going to end the world. And the players, like, uh, encountered this early on. Uh, they investigated it, and they made some choices that made them deviate from stopping this evil sorcerer. And this went on, this was 10 levels ago, right? Six months ago in the game. And they had, you know, as people, completely forgotten about this, were uninterested in it. And then after one random session, the dungeon master was like, and then the world ends. 
So, uh, what do you what do you think about this? Is this uh, is this an instance of uh, railroading to uh, say, okay, well, I've not prepared one particular outcome, but I have prepared a plot where an evil sorcerer were, will end the world in nine months unless the players stop them. Uh, yes, it's absolutely railroading. I mean, <laughs> uh, it's it's. I mean, there's it's a funny example because you. The, but the, but the, Rob, I didn't negate any player well, agency. Right. The, well, uh, you know, I, throughout I the course of the game, the DM didn't, but the game ended, essentially permanently ending player agency. So I guess technically, up until that point, players yeah. had agency. But uh, yeah, otherwise, this is clearly an example of railroading. Um, right. A funny one, but a, a but... very funny one. This is an example of the fact that you have to take a step back as the dungeon master mm -hmm. and say, not only am I interpreting and helping players interpret the consequence of their actions, right? What choices they can and can't make and, and hopefully promoting their agency is I also determine the overall plot of the world. Sure. You could have the evil sorcerer that they ignored at level two in the world six months later. You could also just have an asteroid hit the planet. <laughs> right. Oh, you weren't looking up in the skies for an asteroid. Um, sorry, the world ended, right? Yeah. You could do that, but you don't have to, right? Right. You you, you could always do rocks fall, everyone dies. That's, that is within your power to do right. as a DM, but... Just shouldn't. because you gave the players a hook that there was an evil sorcerer trying to bring about the apocalypse doesn't make this any different than just rocks fall, everyone dies. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> I, I I, mean, I, I'm moderately sympathetic to this. You know, I sometimes have... I sometimes plop big threats that the players sort of need to respond to and then they faff about. But you can also just remind them you know, there's there's yeah. ways to. <laughs> I, I right. Well, you I, can I, remind them in person. You can remind them in game. Yes. Like one yes. of their allies goes right. up and like, hey, so and so's uh actually uh gathered three of the four orbs of dragon kind and uh and they're like, oh yeah, we ran into that jerk off uh ten levels ago. Maybe we should go investigate. Maybe we should do this. something about that. Well, this this is a good time to talk about. Why DMs might think that they need to railroad. Exactly. The, why does this happen? Because because this is getting into, like, wh why, do, why do DMs do this? Because, you know, I, I've posited that it's because they're inexperienced or because they're, yeah, they lack confidence. But also, but also, there are legitimate excuses for railroading. And I think we should examine them uh, to, be, to be fair and to, you know, sort of, uh, I guess, uh, consider both sides, Matt. Ah, hmm. We do love to consider both sides of the issue. One of the main reasons why, or the excuse for railroading, is that if, you know, DMs will say that if the, your players don't, right, uh, you, 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 they have to do it to keep, you know, difficult players in line, right? Like, if you don't mm. slam, you know, if you don't slap their hand, if you don't, like, make sure that they stick to the, you know, the script, then they're going to do wacky things, like... Uh, kill the king when they have an audience with him or steal, you know, a sweet roll and chase the, you know, lead the town guard on a chase throughout the city and totally throw everything into chaos and disarray. And so you have to say, uh, gotta no, steal, eat, gotta still live. Yeah. They'll do a, a fun Aladdin musical them exactly. through the city, and, which and, actually, and then, that sounds great. Stop, sounds, sounds great. Stop thinking that's but, great. That's bad. That's but, bad. It's bad, but also, but also good. And so, so DMs will say, well, if I, you know, if I don't make the king, you know, surrounded by an invisible force field, or if I don't, you know, um, have the villain have a ring of counter spells so they can't, you know, right. Uh, fucking power word, kill them or right. You know, then, finger of death. Then, them in the you know, of everything speech. will go off the rails. Yeah. So, so what do you say to that, Matt? What do you, what do you say to that argument about? Okay. Why one must railroad the difficult player excuse, right? Okay. I think that's a that makes sense, especially to a new dungeon master, because especially when you have new players, right? You have mm -hmm. the players who are like, oh, I can do anything in this game. I'm going to go, uh, you know, uh, steal everything from everyone. I'm going to wander off from the rest of the party and, and be be a nuisance, right? Well, first, I would say sometimes that's lots of fun, right? <laughs> right. Um, as long as everyone else at the table it's not like the uh, wacky rogue show or wacky bard show. 
is having fun, uh, this is a great opportunity for, you know, your players to explore the world you've built and engage with your world building, right? Um, so if you're like building a world and not a specific step-by-step -step novel or story, that's lots of fun. Uh, and then if it gets out of hand, right, that's the sort of, we have a social agreement at this table that right. we're all going to tell a story together. And if you keep going to a city on the other side of the planet, well, it's going to be just really just difficult logistically. Right. Um, the Alexander has another good take on this, which is, you know, um, if, you know, your relationship with your players is that like they're naughty children and you have to keep them in line and you're, <laughs> That's you're, right. you're, it's, Examine it's, your own head here. <laughs> are you a school marm or are you their friend who's telling a story? Right. With them? That's a fundamentally broken relationship, right? Like the, the it, it, it's no, di it's like if your players are like, you know, if they like physically hit another player at the table or if they're obviously cheating, like those are things that cannot be fixed by in-game decisions. Like, that's, th th that's right. If we could only de design a better system, it will fix the problem of people <laughs> being assholes. Right. Uh, in, in this case, you know, this is, there are some problems that you have to talk with people about, right? Yeah. And if your player is deliberately, like, being disruptive in-game, then either you or the other players need to do something about that. Now, yeah, to if... put a bow on this one, I would say, what's the solution for this? It's, it's the, that that a uh, social agreement that yes, you should have right. it could come from a session zero or something you've worked out through play, right? It's talking to players outside of the game. Exactly. And if it is something that can be managed, right? If let's go with the, again, assassinating the King or emperor or whatever, that could be fun. Like, yeah, it throws the entire plot into disarray, but if you're willing to roll with it and figure out what that means for the world and for the the campaign, that can be a lot of fun. They have to escape the palace. They maybe meet up with a rebel group. They maybe form a resistance, you know, let it, let it ride if you can. Yeah. But if they're, you know, if you feel like you need to railroad to stop your difficult players from being difficult, then the problem is not a game in-game problem, or it's not entirely an in-game problem. And railroading them is not going to make the game any more fun or make those players any less difficult. Yeah, that's a great point. Okay, I, I think I can uh, add another car to this train you've got chugging awesome. along here. Let's 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 uh, let's hook it up. Let's another yeah. legitimate. Let's, let's couple. Let's couple let's those train cars. <laughs> Oh man, <laughs> I love that noise. Man, I used to live right next to, as Rob knows, right next to a train, uh, which you can probably hear in some in of our old some of episodes. Our episodes. And I fucking loved it because once this happened to me one time. It was one of the best days of my life. We were sitting here <laughs> recording, and a train went by with a sweet ass. And this was a long time ago, before the Mandalorian was on on screen. A sweet ass Boba Fett like graffiti on the side. I was like, oh, this is beautiful. This is a sign from the train gods. It is. Does your world have a god of trains? If so, if not, <laughs> you should add one. You should, you should make sure that there is one, yes. The one thing that I loved about uh, Peter F. Hamilton's uh, Pandora Star novels. Warp trains. Or warp trains. In interdimensional trains. So good. He recognized, listen, at, at a certain point, there's only you've basically perfected the design of something. And the best way to transport bulk goods, heavy goods over the land is a fucking it's, train. It's a train. You're not going to get any better than that. It will never it's get better gonna... than trains. It, yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. Actually, I'm not sorry. I take you that should back. should not be sorry. <laughs> we'll never sorry. apologize. And for if trains. you've got warp gates, you should be setting trains through your warp gates. Yeah. So cool. That's efficient. I hear the train a coming. It's rolling round the bend. And I ain't been kissed, Lord, since I don't know when. The boys in Crescent City don't seem to know I'm here. Legitimate reason for railroading is that if I don't force, and this is more like a small scale thing, if I don't right. enforce some railroading, the, 
players will miss something important. Right. Right? If I don't say, well, okay, roll a perception check. All right, I got a four. I'm like, oh, you see the, the difficult to spot thing, right? Um, otherwise, they're going to miss the plot. I feel like that's a fairly legitimate excuse that people come up with. What do you think? I mean, that's that's a very common argument. Uh, and it is it is true that that's like something that I, I guess I guess that can happen and that that is a concern. But there's just lots of ways to deal with that that don't involve removing player agency you know right. you can always this is like a role thing right it's like yeah uh why did you have me make this role if i was always gonna succeed yeah or always going to fail right right well okay so i i do want to i do want to push back on this a little bit okay just on one thing you should never in my opinion make a role that you ask for a role that your players will always fail that's there's no point in that. That's yeah. that's railroading. It's cruel. It's cruel. I uh, I do think sometimes it is fine to ask them to roll even if you know they're going to succeed because mm. sometimes it's nice to roll the dice. Um, this is this is a this is a gray area soft DM thing that I like to do. I guess obviously if they roll a one, um, something funny happens, but it's mm. usually about something not critical. And it's something, you know, that I can be reasonably confident that they're going to succeed on. Okay. I think it's fine also. Uh, maybe I would modify that at least at my table to have, like, if it's something that is so obvious they're always going to succeed at a base level, if you're rolling the dice, there are degrees of success, right? Yes. Um, you know, if they, if they beat a DC 15, they see the mysterious person's face as they walk by. If it's lower than that... Uh, they just catch that it was a cloaked figure. If it's higher than a 25, you know, uh, they, they see exactly the the distinctive tattoo on their left right. hand. Too. That's exactly yeah. right. This is always something that is non-critical and there are degrees of success for, and it's just uh, additional information. The um, other way to avoid this, right, if it's like, oh, I can't have them miss this search check or this perception check or right. this diplomacy with the NPC that they're going to spend the next three sessions talking to is to have multiple NPCs, multiple right. search checks, multiple, multiple clues. perception, multiple we've ways we've to find We've talked about this a lot. Right. Like, you never want, you really should not have the plot or, or hinge on one Right. Roll. Imagine you have this branching tree, and if it all comes down to one point, right? Yes. <laughs> Your right. Jenga tower is going to fall over. Exactly. We've talked about this dozens of times. Always have multiple clues, multiple NPCs, multiple paths. It's okay if they all kind of lead in the same direction, but don't require all player choice to go through exactly one person, one role, one object and if they miss it or do it wrong then you have to sort of just give it to them because otherwise the plot can't advance because they're going right. to notice that and they're going to yeah. realize they're on rails so to put a ribbon on this uh if the excuse is well if i don't railroad if i don't negate the player choice here they will miss something and the plot will move forward remember you can restructure that plot so there are many clues many opportunities for success or failure so that then player choice can matter, right? Um, and uh, as you do this, your players will, it will be the opposite as uh, of as what Rob described of like captive uh, player syndrome, right? Your players will get more creative, right? Instead of looking for that one thing or waiting for you to tell them to make the spot check and then they make it and then the plot advances, they will be looking for fun things, right? It will mm -hmm. grow their creativity and agency. And the the issue, well, okay, do we want to talk about some more examples before we get into um, sort of big takeaways? Yeah, uh, I, have, I have actually one more legit excuse. I think it's a short one. Oh, okay. I think okay. it's an obvious one, right? It, which is... A dungeon master will say, and this is one that I thought of after we did our episode on um, uh, my my brother and and me. Um, 
uh, the adventure the, zone the adventure zone right um where we looked at it and it's like well if i don't railroad players into a predetermined outcome they're gonna miss my my cool stuff right <laughs> right sorry my late uh, thank encounter you this was this was the other um excuse that i had and i forgot about it yes this, right. is, this is a common excuse in that in that show uh travis the dungeon master has a a really cool, wacky encounter fighting a, a billion demons. Uh, kill a billion demons. Kill a billion oh, great demons. Great graphic, great graphic novel. Uh, and a um, I don't know, fighting chaos itself and all sorts of wacky stuff. And the players were like, "Well, yeah, that was a pretty cool encounter, right?" And he forced the players to confront it, even though they had proposed an alternative s- solution mm-hmm. that Travis could have said yes and and yes but to. Mm-hmm. And I think Travis's defense, as many d- dungeon master defenses of railroading, is if I don't railroad the players into this particular outcome, they're gonna miss the cool encounter or scene that I made. So is this a legitimate defense of railroading? No, it's not. <laughs> uh, it's uh, it, this is this is a common one, and, and, and to me, um, it's the weakest of all of them, right? Because it's saying my stuff is so cool. Yeah that the players must encounter it that they have no they have nothing to offer to this game they have no uh, it's interesting egotism. it is it is they, they have no interesting ideas of their own their proposed approach is uh, not as creative or interesting as what i have already pre-prepared i understand the struggle of having put together a fun encounter or a cool npc or a neat mystery and having your players just ignore or sidestep it but you know what that is the that is the burden that we bear matt that is the the struggle of dungeon mastering and it is just as fun and perhaps even more so when your players like actually i want to do this instead and they have a good idea and a, a good approach and you roll with it and and that's that's the real problem this is my least favorite and this is why i think many dms railroad is because Again, I think there's a good impulse behind this. They put a lot of effort into something. They yeah, came up with a cool did, idea. Right? It's cool. But you have to let that go because yeah. no one's going to have fun, including you, if you're just sort of like shoving your players into your, you know, arrayed set pieces. Yeah. And and the thing is, all is not lost, right? Ideas don't go away, right? Oh, yes. you're gonna have an encounter in a shifting plane of chaos where players like swap bodies every three rounds or something. That can happen again. That can happen. Right? In no, another appropriate listen. situation. Just save your ideas. Just write them down on a goddamn piece of paper and uh, use them at another appropriate time. Listen, this is maybe not the best example, but, you know, Matt Mercer comes to most of his sessions with, like, miniatures and, like, a big, like, set right. piece oh, battle. Oh, I spent a bunch of money on Dungeon D- Dwarven Forge or whatever. But yeah. his players usually get there without having to be goaded or you know railroaded i mean they they have a very like cooperative cohesive gaming group and everyone is sort of like working together toward a goal but this is a good example right if you're if you're on the same page with your players you don't need to railroad right you don't you know you won't have to like they'll pick up what you're putting putting down you'll have a good gaming session right you'll understand what's what sort of story you're telling together and that's the key part right is that mercer and his crew are really good at telling a story together they want to tell a similar type of story and but he doesn't force them and you shouldn't force your players until you to get to um i think that's a good point to build on that one thing that i think we should point out is that it's also okay to have like a fairly linear plot or linear dungeon master. Yes. Like it, Sorry. Your plot doesn't have to be an infinite branching thing, right? Yes. You're creating a plot. You're creating a situation. It could have three steps to it. All we're saying by not railroading is you have to be open to what the players choose and decide and discuss and act on. Yes, sorry. I really wish I, I should have brought this up in the sooner, but this is a great point. There's a difference between having a linear story and railroading. It is entirely okay to have a linear story. A, a lot of great adventures are extremely linear, but 
they can be linear without, again, the critical part here is removing player agency or forcing players to make an exact set of decisions. Like, it's okay to have, it's even great to have a linear story. You just, you know, it's not everything has to be an infinite sandbox. Right. And that's yeah, not that, a great group. That's a great type of play for everybody. Yeah, you don't have to say, um, well, if I'm going to avoid railroading, I have to map out the entire world and it's going to be a sandbox where players can do anything, right? You can sit down with your players and say, the story that we want to have is that you are going to confront uh, Tiamat or the right. cult of Tiamat. Yeah, maybe Tiamat will show up or something, you know? Okay, if that's the game we're going to play, that's fine, right? Can I give an example of like linear design? Well, I, I want to, yes, I, I do, but, but yeah. bring up Tiamat. Circling back to your sorcerer blows up the world example, like <laughs> yeah, that was so fucking funny. You, you, what the, a I would I would just walk away from that ta that dungeon master. <laughs> I will never return. Like what the, the thing, fuck, the, dude? An asteroid ended our campaign, right? The Why? Thing, the Why thing would is, you choose that? <laughs> the thing is, is that you say you know you present your players early on with Tiamat is rising and is going to destroy the world, or um. An ancient rune lord is trying to reactivate all of the the rune stones and become whatever. Or uh, we got to talk about rise of the rune lords sometime, which, which is a pretty again linear, a, a pretty linear adventure, right? Yeah, but it's a fun one. It's a good one. But you you can present your players with that, and they should probably respond. Well, okay, we should stop Tiamat from destroying the world, right? Or we should stop the rune lord from activating all the rune stones and becoming king of everything that that's a you know that's a pretty like normal response and if they don't and they do something else you shouldn't just have the world end uh six months later but that is an extremely linear adventure but it's entirely plausible and logical and everybody can agree and have a good time that the the correct outcome is for the players to try to stop the world from ending. Yeah. And there are lots of little decisions like that where, yes, your players could choose to do something else. They probably, again, if everybody is on the same page and being agreeable, they'll probably want to go along with the general linear progression of things. Right. But you don't have to force them to. Yeah. Here, here's an example, right? Okay. So, let's sorry, say you're going to give an example of linear design. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully it'll make the, what Rob is saying more clear, right? Like, let's say we're playing a sci-fi campaign, Rob, and, and here's the linear plot I've come up with, right? Players uh, have to kill um, the the evil warlord of a, of a planet, right? Maybe it's a Star Wars or, you know, space opera campaign. They have to go down there and kill this bastard. The plot I have developed is they have to land on the planet, gather information, um, uh, and uh, kill the ruler and deal with the consequences, right? Those are three clear steps in line. Those are the things that are going to happen. That, to me, is like fairly linear design. Right. But it's not railroading, right? Because right. so many things could happen on those three steps. Just as if you have a three-room dungeon, right, where all of them are in a row. That is completely right. fine, right? Your yeah. dungeon doesn't have to be a maze. What could make it railroading, right? Well, it's railroading if they must challenge right. the Grand Moth in his... Um, Over you know, the volcano. You right, know. yes, in his volcano base uh, at the center of his you know, command tower. Uh, and that is the only place they can ever encounter him. Right. Like If, if the gathering information about the Grand Moth has to happen at the CD cantina and can't happen anywhere else, right? You know, you're negating player choices, right? Let's say the players come up with a plan to pose as interplanetary traitors, right? After they gathered information and discovered the, the warlord, the moth has a, a guard of elite giant killer ninja robots. So they lure the grand moth to a fancy dinner party where he's not going to have those giant robots. Right. If you instead say, wait a second, I planned this cool, I created this cool right. stats for giant robots. Uh-oh, the giant robots burst in and you have to fight them anyway, despite right. you coming up with this cool plan to lure him away. You know, you, you just negated all the cool things they 
they felt like doing. And your players aren't going to want to do cool things the next time, right? Right. Exactly. You know, if they find out the Moff has to travel to visit an outpost and they want to ambush his convoy, don't say, oh, um, actually, he decides not to do that and he stays in his volcano base because we have to have a really cool fight in the volcano base. That's, you know, that's removing player agency, right? If they come up with a cool idea, find a way to run with it. Yeah. Uh, not to, like, pat ourselves too much <laughs> on the back or, or uh, you know, sit around uh, 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 wanking each other off, Rob. But, like, when we, uh, the first adventure we published as part of this podcast, The Celestial Job, is a very linear adventure, right? However, it's also, like, at least in my opinion, it's not a railroady adventure. It's a great example of linear design that's not a railroad, right? Why the players are proceeding in the plot um, is up to their own choice and agency. How mm -hmm. they go about moving from encounter to counter is is great. If they succeed is an open question, right? Mm -hmm. um, and if they don't succeed, there will be interesting consequences. If they do succeed there will be interesting consequences. And what happens and how they choose to succeed, like what they choose to do with the final like artifact they find, is all open to their own choice, right? Um, but, you know, it's linear, right? They have to start in a uh, sigil, they have to go to a, an outer plane, and they have to go through like a three-room dungeon that is three rooms in a row. But it's not railroading. I mean, I agree. And, and this is how I design all of my encounters and all of my adventures, is they all actually tend to be pretty linear, in fact, because I have a pretty good idea in my mind of, like, how I think the plot ought to progress. But at every point, I have either completely open-ended or many, many options for how the players can or might approach a situation uh different right. outcomes and especially you have like at plans as, for how players might approach it yeah. and you make room in your game yes, i've right. seen this for a plan that you didn't think of right exactly. because you're not so egotistical that you're the only person who could be creative and and this is easier if you tell yourself you are designing a world and a scenario populated by actual npcs and you know, uh, responsive to your players rather than you're running them through the plot of your novel, right? Like, right. It, it's it's purely a, a shift in perspective, right? You're building... If you know that the Grand Moff takes lunch, you know, in the cafeteria okay. every day, and you know that he likes to, you know, exercise in the yard, like, if if you just, you know... You don't have to write out the schedule for everybody, but like just as an example, like if you just know that he is a person who does things and you know that the, you know, that there are all these different like moving parts in a real and existing world, then it's not so hard or it's not as daunting uh, when your players want to explore that or approach things differently. And yes, maybe you have fewer magnificent set piece battles exactly where you want them to be, but you can still have plenty of those. And yeah, those will still happen. The still fear happen. of uh, not having a set piece battle is, I think, yeah. very set. And the thing is, the players will remember the fact that they lured the Grand Moff to a fancy dinner party and in a well-coordinated plan just stabbed him in the back and then all fled away yes. wearing coordinated uh, outfits much more than your cool set piece battle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The yeah, I, I think this is summed up. Uh, Sly Flourish, uh, Dungeons Master Advice, sums this idea up in you build worlds, not stories, right? Mm -hmm. You and your players build the story. You're building the world, right? This is just sort of another way of saying uh, prepare uh, situations, not predetermined plots, mm -hmm. right? Um, that's all we're saying, I yeah. think, at the end of the day. This whole big mess. Yeah. And yeah, it's really that simple. 
heading for the station with a pack on my back. I'm tired of transportation in the back of a hack. I love to hear the rhythm of the clickety clack and hear the lonesome whistle, see the smoke from the stack. And pal around with Democratic fellas named Mac. So take me right back to the track, Jack. Choo choo, choo choo, jiboogie, woo woo. Yeah, uh, <laughs> to leave us with uh, one more, uh, like, someone on the internet, again, just as a reminder, this is how players feel when they are railroaded. Here's a, a quote from, uh, what is this, Quora, I think, the greatest place for, <laughs> the greatest. for internet answers yes. since Yahoo Answers. Yes, rest died. in peace, Yahoo Answers. My current GM is running a campaign and is very video gamey like mm. it started out super fun and the deeper we get the less fun i have the reason is it feels like the gm is telling us a story but we cannot interact or change anything during his quote cut scenes unquote no matter what any player does he just says no it didn't work yeah you can do that see if you roll a 20. we also can't damage any bosses uh he has until we reach a point in the story that he has plans so our interactions with villains don't matter I feel like he is making us sit there and listen to an anime he has come up with in his head. <sighs> this is, I, I mean, don't make your players feel like this, right? I, I, I find myself that, sitting here thinking, why would I react? It doesn't matter. Yeah. I think this happens. I think this happens a lot because people misunderstand what the role of a, a DM is and what right. the, the, but also what the purpose of a, um, you know, a role playing game is what the, what makes it fun, right? It's not, again, it's not running a bunch of running a captive audience through your novel. It's coming up with a, you know, scenarios and worlds and, um, engaging with them with your players and, right. and yeah. again, I I get that it's scary to sort of say yes when your players uh, plan to do something you know, maybe that you didn't expect, but they will appreciate that you tried, even if it's not as perfect in, you know, at the table as, as you had hoped, right? Um, it will be better in the long run for both your players and you than that perfect sequence of events that you wrote out, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can do this, you can't, but I'll, I'll go ahead and let you all know as a, as a GM, I let my players know uh, when, when they do something that's like completely off the rails, uh, mostly to buy myself time. But I'll, yeah, I'll just it's okay I'll just, to say that. Yeah, I'll just say, wow, I didn't expect that. And you you may want to, like, keep the veneer of secrecy. That's fine. But I, I, I like to be candid with my players and just say, OK, give me a minute because I don't <laughs> I, I didn't expect that. And I need a second to figure out, like, what uh, what that means. But that's fine. We'll go there. And your players will appreciate that. They like it. In my experience, they like it when they, you know, uh, do something unexpected and then see where it goes. In fact, they love it. Yeah, they absolutely do. Right. Because you are recognizing their like uh, their souls as storytellers, too. Right. You are saying when Rob says you didn't do you did something I didn't expect. Give me five minutes. You are saying. I recognize that I am not the only storyteller here and that your ideas are just as cool and interesting as the ones I sort of sketched out when I was prepping mm -hmm. this situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, any final thoughts on railroading? We haven't really like solved the debate. We've really just sort of, obviously we can't, but like, you know, no. I yeah. hope, I hope we've contributed meaningfully to the discourse here and right. helped you all understand what's at stake. Um, I, I just think yeah. it's really, a, I think that it's, you know, it's, listen, it's difficult for everybody to relinquish control, not least of all a, a DM. I, I often find myself dungeon mastering because I don't like to be out of control of the pace of the game. So this is right. a, an admission of mine, but more broadly within being a, a GM, it's I I have learned as I've gotten better to relax my control of the narrative and just see where it takes me. And this is hard. This is challenging. And uh, especially if you're not great at improvising and you, you know, worked really hard on something, but it is entirely doable. 
it is possible and um it's a lot more fun in my opinion than trying to you know keep a you know tight grip on where the game goes at all times yeah you want your players to get better at playing role playing games to have more fun to become better role players well stop negating their agency and choices right and i think to to like wrap it up like railroading is not designing a, a a set of you know if then linear adventures that 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 is fine right it is not uh doing anything but a giant worldwide sandbox right um uh railroading right as we said at the very beginning it's it's negating a player's choice right or or establishing one predetermined outcome it's respecting your players as storytellers and i think you know i i hope that's something we can all agree is a good thing right um, i think so so in my opinion to, to like wrap it up there's not good railroading or bad railroading right <laughs> right i have definitely seen out there online no it's like okay if if we're saying that railroading is negating a player's choice then that's unequivocally bad and the less we do it the more fun our players will have and the better they will get at like having fun playing these types of games yeah and listen i don't want to indicate i mean i'm not perfect about this i don't yeah, think any D dm is like yeah sometimes my villain will have a ring of counter spell or sometimes they prepared a spell that uh you know makes it so they last an additional round in combat or maybe they're uh you know a critical part of their tower has uh anti-scrying on it or something like that you know i'll, I'll I, you know, will do things from time to time that, you know, will frustrate my players, but rarely and uh, whenever I can get away with it, I won't. And you can ask them because a lot of my villains die really quickly, uh, no matter how hard I try to right. make sure that they last in more than a couple rounds in combat. Uh, because, you know, I am frequently surprised by what my players do, both in and out of combat. And, you know, I've had them skip entire dungeons that i had planned um so you know nobody's perfect about this but the the more you can get away with g letting your players pursue their ideas and um exercise their character agency the better yeah great point rob and i think we meant to read this letter at the beginning but hopefully uh, looking back at the episode, hopefully like we've answered all of the things. And this was such a great letter. And this is, uh, this is from one of our listeners, Chris, uh, I'll read it, uh, okay. now, Rob, if, if that's, okay. I'm listening, let's do it. Dear Matt and Rob. First, I'm so glad I found your show. There is always something that inspires my games, both as a player and as a DM. And it generally feels good to hear good people talk proudly about my little, uh, nerdy secret and moan about capitalism. Thank you. So we're here for now, I feel this is something you have covered before, in fact, probably over and over in digressions and adjacent points, but as I slowly and happily work my way through the backlog of episodes, I thought asking might speed up the search. As a DM, I railroad far more than I am comfortable with. With While my players are incredibly gracious and pretend not to notice, I am certain that from time to time, when the narrative that I have constructed becomes so set in my mind during prep, I don't offer my players enough agency to actually guide the plot themselves, and this is part uh, the part that all of us enjoy the most. When I first noticed this in attempting to rectify the problem, I wrote out four different adventures for the next session to give them free reign over where to go next. That part, aside from the time it took, worked out great, but the problem remained, in that once they had chosen their adventure for the day, I pulled up my notes and proceeded with the usual, well, then this happens. This is your adventure. This is what happens to you. Isn't this fun? And the real question is, yes, and. How the hell do you practice this without taking some improv classes? I know this is something that takes a long time to develop real skill in, and generally it's more about letting go and listening to your players. But any extra nuggets of insight would be greatly appreciated, especially for new DMs and those of us who cling to details like the proverbial rope ladder dangling from a helicopter hovering over a bubbling volcano. Once again, thank you for everything you do. Your materials become an absolute staple of my D&D education. I really appreciate the time and effort you guys put into making it. Next time you find yourself on the other side of the Atlantic, let me know, and the ales are on me. All the best from Britain, Chris. 
This was a great letter. Chris, thank you for writing. Uh, Chris, I feel like you're being a little too hard on yourself here. Without yeah. knowing the specifics, I don't think that you are guilty of that much railroading. And and hopefully over the, the past episode, we've sort of discussed a lot of what you bring up here. But what you're doing is fine. And it sounds like you're trying to work on railroading less, which is really all that anybody can ask of you. Yeah, you said it yourself, letting go and listening to your players. That's scary and hard to do, and it takes practice. And the nuggets of insight, again, you're already, the thing is, you just, you're doing it. You're you're doing it, man. You just need to keep, keep on going. Like I said, a, a good thing to do if you find yourself completely like dumbfounded by an unexpected turn to say, wow, okay, I need uh, five minutes to, to, you know, work this out because I wasn't expecting you to do that. So take a quick break, you know? Um, also, my other advice is don't prepare for adventures before a session. <laughs> Ask your players at the end of the last session, <laughs> which of the things they're going to do so you can prepare one Next right, set right. of scenes yes. or scenarios. You, you can save yourself whatever. a lot of time. You can even just... email them. Just yeah. be like, hey, uh, we ended at a pretty open point. Which one of those things? Where are y'all going to go next? Like, you know, <laughs> I'm not going to prepare for adventures. Fuck you, that. you can save yourself. This is a good advice for everybody. You can save yourself a lot of needless prep work by just asking your players, either at the end of the session or in between sessions, what do you want to do next? You can just ask them that. What what yeah. are you going to do next? What you, and and I I encourage you to do that. Just ask them what they want to do next and then you can save yourself some trouble. Yeah. God bless you for preparing for adventures. Listen, I do but... this sometimes because I'm having fun. So I I get it, Chris, yeah. but yeah. Um yeah. but no, Matt's right. Uh, you can't do this every time and you should not. So yeah, w one 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 tip is definitely just ask them. Here's some hooks you have here's some paths what do you think you're going to do next and hopefully they'll tell you and then you can prepare for that for next time yeah. <laughs> but yeah. otherwise you're doing everything right you know i i um you know it sounds like you're working on it and uh, this is exactly what i would do and i frankly i would just talk to your players uh relax and take it slow you don't have to have a an answer for everything right on the spot. You know, you you are allowed to, as a DM, um, take the time that you need to make sure you get it right, you know, and be patient with yourself and just let your players know that you're working on it. Yeah. And if they're having fun, and by the way, you're probably not railroading that much. And it's, uh, you know, you, you don't need to be too worried. So, you know, pay attention to them and talk to them and listen, like you said, and I think you're doing fine. Remember, it's all kind of a conversation, right? Yeah. Um, it seems like, you know, uh, as we all are, you're a little afraid maybe of uh, just going with uh, whatever your players want to do, right? To say that yes and. And you know what? Sometimes when you let your players go off on do those, do whatever they want, you will fuck up, right? You'll come up with something that is not that interesting, not that cool, maybe doesn't make logical sense or something with other things that you've established. And that will be okay, mm -hmm. right? Because you're showing your players you're willing to let them do do interesting things. Yeah. And they will appreciate that just mm -hmm. as much as the, uh, this is your adventure, this happens to you, isn't this fun, right? If they're good for tagging along with that, you know that you're going to be, you know, uh, you're going to be good with tagging along with them, mm -hmm. right? Exactly. Even if you fuck it up a little bit the first couple times. Yeah. All right, Chris, thanks for writing. Yeah, thanks for I, writing, Chris. I'm optimistic. You know, let us know how your uh, endeavors progress, but I, I think you're on the right track. Um, so that's been our, our big episode on, on railroading. Um hopefully mm -hmm. this was helpful um you know i i do think again it is stressful and challenging to not know where you're going to go next but as soon as you let go of the expectation that you're going to know 
what's going to happen and the players will do exactly what you expect them to do. It actually gets much easier. And so that's what, that's my big picture, you know, mindset advice for DMS is to, you know, just stop expecting to have control of the narrative and it will become much less frightening when you find out that you don't. Right. <laughs> it, it's a thing you practice at. And again, um, it's a thing that one of the great things is systems that are not D and D some of them force you not to do this, right? <laughs> uh, force you not to prepare a plot um, mm -hmm. because sometimes player actions create plot, right? Uh, right. So this right. is something that if you really need to break yourself out of it, you know, you can try one of those games where a player move or action mm. changes is, what you're doing entirely. This is the other discourse that has been going on that we haven't had a chance to talk about, but this is a great argument for playing other games than D&D. &D. Not because you shouldn't play D&D, &D, but because they make you better at being a DM. But the other games make it very, very easy for you to or for players to have more agency and make it basically impossible for you to deny their agency. And this is just great practice. Yeah. When you have on your character sheet rules is written, it says that, you know, a, an NPC that can do this shows up in the next scene. Well, then you have to go with that. Sorry. You have to go with it. It's rules is written. Damn it. It's, it's, it's in the rules folks. You can't argue with that. All right. <laughs> Thanks for listening, everybody. All right. We've pulled into the station. That's Shh. right. Let's uh let's drive the, the golden spike the, between the boiler. Uh, yes. between the, the two ends of this railroading debate and yeah. uh and yeah, and, and call it call it done. Uh, if you have thoughts, disagreements, you're angry at us, you agree, you have questions about your own uh game of am I railroading, please write us uh DM of none at gmail.com at us on Twitter at DM of none. Um, please rate review, subscribe, tell your friends. Um, we also have a Patreon, patreon.com slash dungeon master of none, where you can see for yourself our own designs where we hopefully have not railroaded you too much. And also, yes, uh, if you subscribe now, not only will you get a bunch of old stuff we've made, including, let's see, May, we had the uh, the Warlord class. For June, we have, uh, I think, a very not railroady uh, adventure from me at the Monagahalas of Madness, uh, a horror adventure. And for this month, I'll be we'll be wrapping up Dice Hard, which is entirely self-contained but in my opinion extremely non-railroady because it's very very open-ended and a good example of how uh, you can have tons of player agency within a contained adventure we'll see if we succeed on that but um these are hopefully good examples hopefully all of you will enjoy the benefits of a classical education from this episode <laughs> and yeah uh, throw a few bucks our way if you if you yeah. liked it or don't we don't care. We the don't choice care. is yours. It's we re you. respect your agency. Absolutely. All right. Stay healthy, everybody. Stay safe and keep rolling them dice.